Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to my shop. You know, as I proceed with this uh, mini mill kit that I'm building, this model that I'm building, I'm going to make a couple changes to the spindle. This is a very mild taper and there's no drift area to knock this thing out. It's not like a drill press. This is a very slight taper. And anybody that's ever worked with tapers or wedges knows the slighter the angle, the greater the potential for it to lock up. So being that they've called out for an 080 thread back here, an 062 diameter 80 pitch draw bar, you can't exactly unloosen that draw bar and smack it and think that you're going to free this if it taper locks. Well, perfect opportunity to change things up. One of the changes I made was I made this from 125 to 156, so that's a larger diameter. Translated to the back of the casting being a larger diameter, allowing me to drill a larger hole through and use a 256 draw bar. <laughs> Big deal, right? 84 thousandths diameter, 2 inches, 300 long-ish. And I changed the front as well. I'm not going to use the slate taper. I'm going to make a mini Cat 40 or Cat .040 taper. Uh, set up as it is and drive it with a couple of ears on the front of the spindle. Let's take a look Mini draw bar 256 thread 084 in diameter 2.3 long ish And I did make a mistake on this. This was supposed to be an 094 square on the end But I'm so fixed on draw bars being a hex that I actually just went ahead and cut it a hex and didn't even realize it I was like, okay, mr. Wizard now. How are you gonna tighten it up? Well, I'm going to show you that in a second. Here's the spindle itself. Let's remove the mini tapered spindle type tool holder. Look at that. I tried to get as close to it, like mimic a Cat 40. <laughs> Maybe like a Cat Point 040, as the case may be. And if you saw my Instagram this week, I had a little cheater picture of this thing on there. I'll put that on there and tighten it down. Draw a bar in the end, and just to show that it is actually making contact. Clock it and lock it, torque it down. Okay, so this is not installed on the machine, as you can see. As I just previously said, this needed to be bumped up to a 156 so I could get the larger draw bar through there. And I'm going to cheat, and we're going to show you that little mini draw bar wrench that I just made for it. Thing of beauty is a joy forever. Love it. Anyway, let's take a look at how this guy was made. Gonna do some fast forward segments on that. Call it a day. The process starts with a 3 8 collet. A 125 high speed steel drill blank in a 3 8 by 1 8 adapter. Lock it down. Norton cup wheel, homemade adapter. It's that quarter 20 screw securing it, nice and tight. Spin indexer in the mill. The 3 8 adapter is placed in the 3 8 collet, and the wheel is placed in the spindle. This is a Norbide stick, and I'm going to dress a concave shape on the inside of the wheel right there. So basically the wheel is now hollow ground and it's only cutting on the inside face. So that small eccentricity you see on the outside, that is not affecting the part quality at all. You got to keep an eye on the grind and make sure that the shoulder that you're working to is nice and sharp. And right there it's running out. It's more of a radius than a nice sharp edge. And as the part turns blue, which you'll see here in a second, you know it's generating too much heat and the wheel's loading up. So off camera, I'm going to dress the wheel again. Watch for the inside radius closest to the adapter to turn into a nice sharp corner. There you go. And when the heat tint goes away, you know you got a nice clean wheel that's doing the cutting that you hope it is. Shooting for a very specific rectangular profile on this part. I'm just going to keep on going until that is achieved. The head on this mill is thrown extremely to the right and the rotation of the wheel is projecting the debris off onto the floor, but the machine is draped anyway. You don't want grinding dust getting down on your machine. That's not a good thing. 
once I'm happy that I have the rectangular format, I'm going to position the wheel, the part, close to the center of the wheel, and I'm going to go up and down with the spindle to basically hollow grind the end of the punch. 55 thousandths by 94 thousandths was my target, and a hollow ground end. Take a light stone to it and knock the grinding burrs off. Now here's a little shot pack for you. If you have a magnet, this, there you go, that's magnetic, and you're going to pick up some debris or pick up some small parts, put the magnet in a bag. And when you wave the magnet over the debris or the small parts that you want to retrieve, the magnet will still retrieve the metallic or the magnetic debris with ease, but it will not stay stuck to the magnet. If you've ever tried to get cast iron dust off of a magnet, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, naturally, this is high-speed steel dust, but it's the same difference. And to clean the magnet, you just simply open the bag or remove the plastic covering from the magnet. And away you go. The debris stays behind. The magnet emerges clean. Just don't let the debris follow the magnet out of the bag. That will happen occasionally. Bada bang. Moving over to the rotary table now. If you've seen this channel for a while, you know I'm a big fan of the motion of the rotary table to the motion of the mill. Okay, don't always trust that center bore unless you've confirmed that it's true. I always disengage my worm feet on my rotary table and move the table manually to indicate my spindle. Because it's the motion of the table to the machine that is most important. It's not that center feature. Using my alignment tool, I'm going to throw this vise 125 off center because I know the material I'm going to be putting in here is 250 wide. So there's my 1 8 shift. I'm going to go back to center and confirm I'm in the right direction. There's 0 and there's 125. So the table is moving to the left. I will bump the vise up against my 0 plane on that tool and lock it down. When the table returns to digital readout zero, I know that the rotary table center is an eighth of an inch off the stationary jaw right now. First step in the operation planning ahead is to put a small window on the piece of brass that I'm going to turn into the small spanner wrench. This window is about five thousandths of an inch below the final surface of the part, so the part has some degree of support during the machining process. This window is just to allow the brooch material some place to go. And one of these days I'll make a new nut for this vise because it is a pain in the neck trying to get that pin in there. There we go. Visually, I lined it up to the center of the window. There really is no critical anything, but that center of that window is now the X, Y, zero position of the rotary table. That has not changed. Right there is the center of the world. First stop is to put an 093 hole in this part. That is a 125 diameter high-speed steel center drill and an 093 or a 330 seconds high-speed steel drill. Getting back to the brooch that we made earlier. Alignment of this brooch is not critical. It can be in any rotation you want. So long as it's over the center of that hole. You do not have to indicate this. And I am not shifting the table. Only the rotary motion. And I think you can see the utility of that window at this point. You could pack these chips up in the bottom of that hole if it was a bottomed hole. If you wanted to, just drill it deeper. That is entirely up to you. And yes, you could have made a hex brooch just as easy, but this brooch is now applicable to a variety of sizes. Test fit the draw bar. Success.
Moving on to the milling phase of this small spanner wrench, make this look more like an actual tool. First step in the process is to round off around the hex feature that was just put in. You know, if I had all the time in the world, I might make an entire socket set and leave it sitting on one of the shelves of this little mini machine. But then uh, you'd have to give me a white jacket and put me in a rubber room because I would be done forever. Going down to a depth of 150 on this. The entire wrench itself is going to be 200 thick. That's about 5 millimeters. Or just less than uh, 7 30 seconds of an inch imperial. So we're at 150 deep right now, and that is a 150 diameter that I just put around that hex. I am not going to let this tool release from the parent material until the very last minute. It's going to be the slitting saw that will probably disengage it. The cutter is wider than the final width of the handle that I'm going to make. So a single pass down the center will be sufficient to establish the top of the handle. I want to come back to zero here for a second. At the 150 depth, run right down the middle of the material and blend out to the surface formed by making that 150 round feature. Now without a doubt there's a little bit of math involved here if you want to know where the tangent spot is for this cutter as not to run the cutter into that vertical cylindrical feature. And if you got a little witness mark on there, well, you know, it just proves you're human, right? Now we'll get pretty close and just leave it at that. I left a very small step on that intentionally. And actually that whole thing could have been done in one move. But that small step almost makes it look like a socket is attached to a handle. So I was, I was pleased with that. This operation right here, I'm going to come down with the cutter. I'm going to stay about five thousandths away from the window itself. So there will be a very thin, very thin web on the short end of this part supporting this piece. I think you can see the benefit by leaving some material in there. No specific formula for the web. I just know that I can probably file that off relatively easy without having to do a rotational angular calculation on where those two radiuses run out I'm going to move to the offset position on the other side and just cut it in reverse not the machine in reverse but the direction in reverse and when I'm clear I'll just lift out you can see the wrench forming pretty nice it's right in there small web on the outside window did its job Handles narrowed down. Time to take some of those burrs off while it's still on the parent material. You know I'm a big fan of that. It's a lot easier to hold. It's a little bit cleaner now. Time to blank it off. I could have done it initially, but it didn't bother. Still going to leave it just as thick, so all my planes are uh, where they were. Make sure you deburr the bandsaw cut so it goes back in nice and easy. Visually lining it up by eye. And we're going to put some scallops in here for the little hands that may grab a hold of this thing. You don't want them slipping off when it's all full of oil from the shop, right? So we're going to put four scallops on both sides of this part. It's an 093 cutter. 332nd diameter cutter. And yeah, that's the same size diameter that went down in the center of that hex. And this is something that I laid out in CAD. These are 94 thousandths apart, 90 thousandths off center. Saw itself is a carbide saw, 51 thousandths thick. So with a 4,000 shim paper, as soon as it starts to drag, I'll back off the part, move down 55. That'll put the top of the saw on the top plane, and then I'll move in the thickness of the handle, which is 50. And here in a second, you're going to see the web catch the part before it flies off. There you go. Easily wiggled and broken. Got some filing and blending in the future of this little guy, but that's what we got right now. Off to the table.
All right, guys. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. This was a uh, necessity. It was fun to make, actually. It was really fun to make. And if you didn't tune in on the how the brooch worked, the brooch was actually a rectangular shape that was only indexed three times. So it cut two sides of the hex each time. So 60 degrees between each index with a brooch that was cut to size, and you come up with a perfect hex fitting the end of this drawbar like a glove. Love it. So that's all we got for today. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're well, happy, and safe. All of the above. I'm Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out.